I'm Daniel Shore. Only one American president in history was forced out of office. And when he died 20 years later, it was without a state funeral in the nation's capital. I'm talking, of course, about Richard M. Nixon. Two years and two months before he resigned to escape impeachment, his undoing began here in the building called the Watergate. Watergate gave its name to a turbulent chapter in American history. Watergate, the worst political scandal in American history, finally destroys President Richard Nixon. The president who opened new doors to Russia and China quits the White House in disgrace. He resigned rather than face impeachment for ordering illegal acts. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. Two years before he resigned, the president's re-election committee had broken into his opponent's headquarters in search of damaging intelligence. There was pressure from the White House, from me, and from the president to the committee to get their campaign intelligence activity going. The break-in team was caught, and the White House launched the cover-up that ruined Nixon. The staff itself uh, was not doing very much as a matter of individual initiative. They were carrying out Richard Nixon's instructions day to day. Now, Nixon's closest advisors give evidence that the Watergate break-in was just one in a series of crimes instigated by the president himself. In 1970, America was in turmoil. Nixon had won the election on a pledge to end the war in Vietnam. Instead, he escalated it. Thousands of demonstrators laid siege to the White House. At 4.30 in the morning, I found myself in the Secret Service command post in the old executive office building. And then, just out of the blue, out of a loudspeaker, comes the message, sort of crackling through, that searchlight is on the lawn. Well, that just hit me as, as hard as it can hit you because that tells you the president is outside the mansion. He's out on the lawn. And it's 4.30 in the morning. He doesn't belong out there. It was not a good time to have a president on the loose. Earlier that week at Kent State University, four students had been shot dead by the National Guard. Nixon feared that a war the Democrats had gotten the country into would cost him his re-election. There was just an eruption of a fury around the country, a lot of young people descending on Washington. And so we had to move quickly to try to figure out how do we protect the White House, how do we protect uh, the city. The idea was raised, well, maybe we should just, like they did in the Old West, circle the covered wagons and, and protect it that way. Behind the barricade of buses, the president tried to defuse the situation before the big protest. He called a press conference in time to reach the students driving to Washington. Until now, Nixon had treated the anti-war protesters as traitors. Now, he changed his tune. They're trying to say that uh, they want to stop the killing. They're trying to say that they want to end the draft. They're trying to say that we ought to get out of Vietnam. I agree with everything that they're trying to accomplish. After his press conference, the president was restless, wondering about how his new line had gone across. At four in the morning, he gave up trying to sleep 
And it was then that the White House aide on duty heard that searchlight was on the lawn. I immediately uh, put a call through to John Ehrlichman and said, uh, the president is outside, not sure what's going on. Bud Krogh called me in the middle of the night, woke me up to say that um, uh, the president was moving uh, and that he appeared to be intent on going out to the mall uh, to hobnob with the protesters, the students and the others who were gathered there. And what should he do? He said, go over and render assistance immediately. The president made for the Lincoln Memorial. There at the foot of the steps, Bud Croak caught up with him. The president was directly engaged in conversation with a number of young people who were wearing combat clothes, uh, peace symbols, uh, long hair. He just kept rambling, and he'd go from city to city, and then he'd stop on a city, and if he thought of a sport in that city, he'd start talking about it. You know, like he got to California, and he thought of surfing, so then that stopped him, and he'd look up and say, are there any surfers? And then he'd start talking about surfing. Krogh nervously maneuvered the president back into the car, but Nixon insisted on continuing his tour. Just about that time, I guess you could say the, the, the cavalry arrived. Um, we had the, uh, the top White House staff. I was very relieved to see them. I was concerned that we know exactly what the president had said and what the kids had said so that we had some basis for admitting or denying what took place. The president said, now let's all walk back to the White House. And I had to explain to him that, that uh, we, he couldn't walk back to the White House. The White House was barricaded by buses, and, and we weren't going, wouldn't be able to get in, even though he had a pretty good ID card. The president's gesture of conciliation failed. Nixon now struck back at the anti-war movement. He demanded to know who was behind the protesters, who was funding them. He called a rare summit meeting of his intelligence chiefs. He ordered the heads of each of the government intelligence agencies, the FBI, the CIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. It was a group of, uh, I think, six or eight men gathered in the Oval Office. I was there. And the president, uh, he, he really took the bark off. He, he, he laid it out to them that he was fed up with the, the bickering between the intelligence groups and, and, and between the directors themselves. The nut of this was, that uh, President Nixon wanted very much to get more information. And if he could just lay his hands on some foreign element that was supporting this activism, then he would have a good political ax with which to uh, uh, wage his own domestic war. The president issued a secret executive order. It gave the intelligence agencies a free hand to tap telephones, open mail, and break into private homes and offices, overriding legal safeguards and citizens' rights. These new powers to spy on Americans at home were, in fact, outside the law. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. If, for example, the president uh, approves something because of a threat to uh, internal peace and order of uh, significant magnitude, uh, then uh, the president's decision in that instance uh, is one uh, that enables those who carry it out to carry it out without violating a law. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover balked at this doctrine of the divine right of presidents. So Nixon decided the White House would have to do its own dirty work. To recruit their first undercover operative, he had dispatched John Ehrlichman to New York. He arrived uh, at LaGuardia on a Washington plane with an entourage of assistants. Uh, typical, you know, everybody had attache cases, leather cases, newspapers, uh, bulky papers under their arms, and I stood by waiting, and finally Mr. Ehrlichman, a very officious, made it known he wished to interview with me in connection with taking an assignment uh, with the President of the United States. So for political things, for personal things, things that were non-governmental, we used Lassowitz and we paid him. Mr. Ehrlichman said that um, 
uh, should it be disclosed or should it come out, leak out or whatever, that I was on a, uh, working for the White House, it would be denied. His first job was to try to dig up new dirt on Chappaquiddick, the controversial drowning incident that had destroyed Senator Edward Kennedy's presidential chances. Ulasiewicz traveled the country in search of damaging information on the Kennedys and Nixon's other enemies. Who gave me my assignments? They came from anywhere around the throne, whether it was from Nixon himself, whether it was Haldeman or Ehrlichman, and it really didn't matter to me. I didn't care if uh, Jehoshaphat was in charge. I did the job as I was asked to do. On June 12, 1971, Nixon's elder daughter, Trisha married law student Edward Cox. The president described it as his happiest day in the White House, but the happiness was short-lived. The next day, coverage of the wedding was upstaged in the nation's leading newspaper. The New York Times led with the Pentagon Papers, a massive leak of top-secret documents tracing three decades of growing American involvement in Vietnam. Two and a half million tons of bombs ago. In October 1969, my, my friend Tony Russo and I began copying the Pentagon Papers to give them to the American Congress and share them with the American public. The American public didn't get them then. It took two invasions later before the newspapers began releasing them. They've got them now. They've got them now. As the Pentagon Papers became a bestseller, Nixon heard that Ellsberg had gotten his hands on yet more secret documents, and that they were now in the possession of a Washington think tank, the Brookings Institution. I was in the president's office one night, and the president turned to me and he said, you get a hold of John Ehrlichman and you tell him to get a hold of the Pentagon, to get a hold of the FBI, do whatever is necessary, I want those documents back from Brookings. The president's private eye was told to case the joint. They bring me in for this thing with, uh, with this uh, uh, Brookings Institute. And I went in as a tourist, and I, um, I reported by phone, no written report, that it was a, certainly a great look and establishment, all marble halls, well guarded. To get past the guards, Colson proposed to Ehrlichman an unorthodox approach. He came up with this idea to uh, start a fire. And in the confusion of fighting the fire, somebody would go in and lift these papers. I said, I don't care how you do it, the president wants the papers back. That's all I know. Word of Colson's scheme reached the president's young counsel, John Dean. Two years later, Dean would bring down the Nixon administration by exposing its conspiracies, including the one that was now brought to him. He said, Chuck Colson has got a scheme that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. He wants me to firebomb the Brookings Institute. I said, what are you talking about? So I immediately went in to see Ehrlichman, told him of the absurdity of this uh, plan and scheme, and found a very unruffled John Ehrlichman who sort of looked up over his glasses at me and, and, and raised his eyebrows and he said, well, maybe we should call it off. Ten days later, the New York Times published another damaging leak. The story gave away the U.S. fallback position in nuclear missile negotiations with the Soviets. The president summoned Ehrlichman and his protege, Bud Krogh. When I walked in, the, the president was standing up behind his desk. Um, then he started to pace back and forth. And he told me that, he, that this kind of uh, uh, leak was intolerable, that we just could not stand any more of them. I remember him slamming his fist into his hand, saying how dangerous this was and it had to be stopped. He wanted a lie detector test given to everybody. He wanted the name of the guy who was responsible. He wanted telephone taps. He wanted, you know, this and that and this and that. A lot of hyperbole, a lot of hubris in the, in the Oval Office. The president's demand for lie detector tests on a massive scale was recorded, like everything said in the Oval Office, by the hidden taping system he had just installed. Nixon's first target was his foreign policy staff. Personal questions about a man's 
sex life, about uh, what a brother was like. I don't know anything about polygraphs, and I don't know how accurate they are, but I know we don't care the hell out of Put fear into these people was how Ehrlichman noted the president's instruction. But the FBI dragged its feet and never identified the leakers for Nixon. Nixon, once again blocked by FBI Director Hoover, and launched his private police force. Instead of a few ex-cops, he now set up a full-time unit inside the White House. Its first task was to deal with Ellsberg. The problem was, since we can't put the guy behind bars for what he did, or nobody thinks that the chances are, are very good, uh, what else can be done to at least destroy his image? Hunt proposed to Coulson a plan to neutralize Ellsberg. Ellsberg had been in psychoanalysis, and Hunt thought his analysis notes could be used to smear him. So he suggested they obtain his psychiatrist's files. The way we would have uh, met that challenge back when I was in the FBI was we would have pulled what is called a black bag job, a surreptitious entry, a covert operation, and simply taken the records. And Hunt said, well, that's a good idea. Gordon Liddy did a partnership act with Howard Hunt that President Nixon would come to regret. When they set up office in the White House, though, they came with high recommendations and were sent on their way with even higher introductions. I called General Cushman, who was deputy director of the CIA at the time, and asked him to extend courtesies to Hunt. I was told by uh, the White House, Mr. Ehrlichman, that a Mr. Howard Hunt had been hired on as a consultant to the White House and that uh, he'd be coming to see me and it'd be appreciated if I could give him a hand. And he needed some uh, papers and uh, disguise to establish an alias. In order to alter my appearance, I was provided with a pair of uh, German manufactured glasses. You'll see that they ha appear to have Coke bottle bottom lenses and would give uh, any viewer of someone wearing these the idea that I was just this side of total blindness. Liddy flew to California with Howard Hunt to check out Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. The CIA provided them with further disguises, made to measure wigs, a device to alter Liddy's walk, and another to distort Hunt's speech. So there we were, walking about uh, in uh, Los Angeles, in the heat, sweating under these very well-fitting wigs, I stumbling along like a cripple, Howard Hunt babbling along like this, all courtesy of the Central Intelligence Agency. They reported to the White House that they could break into the office and the psychiatrist would never know it. Their boss, Bud Krogh, passed the recommendation up to John Ehrlichman, seeking approval for a covert operation to examine all the psychiatric files still held by Ellsberg's analyst. I recall seeing it come back. We had approve, disapprove. There was an E for Ehrlichman uh, by approve, and underneath that he had written in his own handwriting, if done under your assurance that it will not be traceable. And that was our written authority to go out and conduct that covert operation. Not traceable meant that others would have to do the actual breaking. Howard Hunt knew where to recruit others. I come home one day from a day at the office and working, and I find a note up on my, uh, in the glass, up on the door, and I picked it up and looked at it and said, if you are the same Barker I once knew, uh, meet me in such and such a place, Eduardo. It was the 10th anniversary of the Bay of Pigs invasion, the CIA's attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro using Cuban exiles. In Miami, a group of veterans were sought out by their former CIA commander, Howard Hunt, code name Eduardo. He says, we have this organization at the White House level, and the CIA and the FBI respond to this organization, which is a national security team. And this is when he said, they call us the plumbers, because we are there to stop the leaks at the White House. 
the operation Ehrlichman had authorized was ready to go. But did the president know what his White House plumbers were doing in Los Angeles? The question is whether Ehrlichman informed me that these two men were going to California. He may well have. And if he had, I would have said, go right ahead. What we were engaged upon was something that had the full and hearty support of the executive branch of the United States government. You can do no wrong. Now, the men who were to be key figures in Watergate undertook their first illegal operation for the president. They planned to get into the psychiatrist's office through a door they had unlocked. But to their surprise, somebody had locked it again. I said, look, behind these bushes uh, is a window. Now, the window did have steel bars on it. I said, you know, just wrench those off with this equipment we had. Uh, they were very powerful men anyway, and they did. We were looking all and searching all over, and we could not find anything with the name of Ellsberg. And we took a photograph of some cabinets that we broke in, just as a proof that we were there and we were doing our job. That was all. Back in Washington, Krogh saw the photographs and realized that the Ellsberg operation was more than he'd bargained for. They had gone in and basically trashed the office, that rather than it being a covert operation, something that uh, would not be traceable, it, it looked to, to me as if this had been a major, major mistake. It mainlined right back to the president. Uh, usually, uh, when something goes wrong out in a department or an agency, uh, they assume responsibility and the White House stands, stands away from it. Uh, when you have White House people involved, you can't do that. The problem here is we didn't have close enough control. And as I would say, I hope that never in the future does the president have to have another so-called private police force of four uh, uh, doing so much work, uh, uh, in a number of very important areas, and most of which was justified. Despite the fiasco, no one got fired. Indeed, Gordon Liddy, seen here with Nixon, was promoted to an even more sensitive post. The Ellsberg affair became one of the president's darkest secrets as he prepared for the election year. As the campaign began, the Democrats threw themselves into the primaries. Ed Muskie fought it out with his main rival, George McGovern, in the contest for the Democratic nomination. Nixon upstaged the primaries. He pulled off the greatest foreign policy coup of his presidency and wiped his Democratic rivals off the television screens. His visit to Beijing the first by an American president cracked the ice of the Cold War. Nixon always talked about this being a historic first, this being the most of this, the best of that. Uh, and the election was just one more case where we wanted uh, a coronation. We wanted the power that went with the biggest landslide in history. Back home, Nixon took the gloves off. He told his chief of staff to do whatever was necessary to get the dirt on his opponents. They called it political intelligence. He assigned his best men to work on it. I have uh, a copy of, of a memo, which was one of dozens of such memos sent to me. And uh, there's an item in here that says the attorney general discussed with John Dean the need to develop a political intelligence capability. John Dean did, in fact, uh, move himself pretty much into the whole area of political intelligence. We have a responsibility to the citizens of... The president's ambitious young counsel, John Dean, now helped to arrange the most improbable appointment of the Nixon presidency. John Dean said, the best way I could serve the president in 1972, the campaign year, would be to be the political intelligence chieftain. Uh, that uh, what he wanted was uh, a full political intelligence plan. Liddy moved across Pennsylvania Avenue to the president's re-election headquarters. His new boss, Jeb Magruder, wasn't prepared for the phenomenon that the White House had sent him. Uh, I have lots to talk about with people over the White House. Liddy was in the office and I said something uh, as an aside, uh, uh, 
that uh, wouldn't it be good if we could get rid of Jack Anderson? Jack Anderson's syndicated column was a thorn in the side of the Nixon campaign. Gordon Liddy emerged from the office. Uh, he brushed by me and he said, uh, uh, Jeb just told me to take care of Jack Anderson. He said, what's that? I said, I am to kill Jack Anderson. I am on my way to kill Jack Anderson. He said, oh my God. He took off like a deer running down the hall. I then went into Magruder's office and I said, Jeb, uh, did you just tell him to rub out Jack Anderson? And he came back in and I said, uh, to Gordon, I was just uh, talking off the cuff. I wasn't serious. And Liddy looked at me with that stern, you know, sort of macho look. And he said, never give me an order for a hit job that you don't mean because I'll do it. Liddy was impatient to get on with his intelligence operation. Bypassing Magruder, he went straight to the White House to ask John Dean how big he was supposed to think. I said, well, if you're talking about an all-out, full offensive and defensive capability political intelligence uh, operation, you're talking about one hell of a lot of money, first of all. And he said, how about half a million dollars for openers? And I said, well, you're in the ballpark there. Liddy promptly produced a million-dollar plan. He needed the approval of Attorney General John Mitchell, soon to be Nixon campaign chairman. In Mitchell's office in the Justice Department, the Temple of Law Enforcement, Liddy presented his illegal plan, codenamed Gemstone. Gordon had with him these very expensive, uh, well-done charts. I think there were seven of them. Each had different code names. And each one describes some type of activity that would, in a sense, harass the Democrats. Each different kind of operation was given the name of a precious jewel. We had so many operations, we quickly ran out of precious jewels. We went into semi-precious jewels. And by the time we were finished, we were down to coal and brick. He said, clearly one of the major problems of this campaign is going to be the problem of demonstrations. And he said, I think, General, as he told John Mitchell, we have a good solution to that. I have retained the services of some really tough men. What I can do is direct these men to kidnap campaign leaders, drug them, and take them below the Mexican border and put them out of commission. Mr. Mitchell said, well, where do you get people like that? And I said, it's my understanding they're from organized crime. And he said, well, what is that going to cost us? I think for uh, Mitchell, Dean, and I, it was rather uh, ludicrous. Uh, I mean, here we were, in a sense, sitting in the Attorney General of the United States office, and here's Gordon Liddy talking about some of the more bizarre plans. He said, I have uh, I've made some preliminary arrangements to, to get a Chinese motifed houseboat that I can park on one of the canals down near the convention center in Miami and it, ha it will have two-way cameras in this Chinese motifed houseboat, and I'll use prostitutes to go out and seduce into the houseboat high campaign officials. They were to linger about and uh, attract the attention of mid-range Democratic staffers who would try to impress them with how important they were by saying, I'll watch tomorrow, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. We would get all of that. And I said, Gordon, you've got to be kidding. And he really was very offended by my interruption. And he, taking that offense, he said, I want to assure the general these are the finest girls from Baltimore. At the end of Liddy's presentation, John Mitchell took kind of a long puff on his pipe and a little cloud came up over his head and sort of sat there for a minute. And he, he said, Gordon, he said, I just don't think this is quite what we had in mind. So I said to Gordon, I said, well, why don't you cut out all this other f fluffy stuff uh, uh, that it really isn't what we're looking for and concentrate on the electronic surveillance. On the issue of bugging, Nixon's attorney general had taken a high moral tone in public. Mr. Mitchell, how careful will you be about invasion of privacy in the, ma in the matter of a surveillance and wiretap? Well, since I believe so fully and wholeheartedly in the protection of the privacy of the individual, I will make sure that nothing is done in this area of electronic surveillance that will invade the privacy of individuals. Who this are not same Mitchell elected. sat down a second time to hear Liddy's revised plan to bug the Democratic headquarters. Before he could finish, John Dean spoke up. I just said, gentlemen, I just don't think that the things that are being discussed here 
ought to be discussed in the office of the Attorney General of the United States. Dean ran away, got in an elevator, and took off. I, he did not want me to um, start building him a new ass the way I did the last time. But I had Magruder, and I really ripped into Magruder, saying, you know, what's going on here? In desperation, Liddy turned for help to Howard Hunt, his old partner in crime. Liddy said, look, you've got this great uh, friend and, and uh, principal in the White House, Chuck Colson. He's got all kinds of influence. Uh, it's very important to me that this uh, gemstone project go forward because it's my career. My career, will you introduce me to Colson? It was about 5, 30, 6 o'clock one night, a typically frantic day in the White House. My secretary says, Howard Hunt is here, has a friend with him. I'd never met Gordon Liddy. I started talking about our problem about getting a decision on the gemstone plant. Colson did not want to hear about the gemstone plant. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to hear any of this. What you need is a decision, correct? Yes. He said, fine. Picked up the phone, called Magruder. I said, Jeb, these guys are in here. They can't get a decision. What are you guys going to do? Either give them a yes or a no. Don't leave them hanging. What he did was clearly indicate to me he wanted, uh, he, the president wanted, he always used the president, wanted to get uh, this thing off the dime, get it going. So he wanted me to make a decision. There was pressure from the White House, from me and from the president, to the committee to get their campaign intelligence activity going. Nixon was most concerned about one Democrat, Larry O'Brien, often his most effective critic. I thought this administration was a law and order administration. O'Brien was, at that time, the uh, chairman of the Democratic National Committee, the head of the Democratic Party, and at the same time was taking into his own pocket a very, very substantial fee from Howard Hughes. For years, billionaire Howard Hughes had been secretly financing both political parties and the Nixon campaign. Nixon was determined to find out about the O'Brien-Hughes connection and what damaging information O'Brien had on him. I first saw it in the form of a memo that uh, had been dictated by the president on Air Force One to Haldeman saying, isn't it about time we make uh, Larry O'Brien accountable for his retainer with Howard Hughes? Larry O'Brien's office in the Democratic National Committee now became the key target of the bugging operation. It was located in the huge luxury complex called the Watergate. What Colson wanted me to do was to get off the stick, as he said, and, and get Liddy's project uh, to bug uh, uh, Larry O'Brien's phone and uh, so on off the ground and get it funded. The decision on Liddy's project was made in Key Biscayne, Florida. Campaign chairman John Mitchell was on vacation there. But Magruder could wait no longer. He interrupted his boss's Easter break to get the plan approved. What happened at this meeting has always been a point of fierce controversy. Now, did you approve the Liddy plan? At the Key Biscayne? I, yes. I have never approved the Liddy plan as we're discussing it at any time, and certainly I didn't approve it at Key Biscayne. John Mitchell died in 1988, still denying he had ever approved the Gemstone plan. The surviving participants, however, tell a different story. Well, the last item on the agenda was the Gemstone file. And the issue now was that we either had to approve it or it was going to be too late for us to do anything. So Mitchell, LaRue, and I talked about it. I asked uh, Jeb, I said, what the hell is this uh, uh, electronic surveillance business? He said, well... That's been in the mail a long time, and I'm getting a lot of pressure to get an answer on it. The president uh, wants it done. Haldeman seems to think it's very important. Colson's been on my back. Mitchell read it. Uh, he looked at me and said, have you read this? I said, yes. He said, what do you think of it? I said, John, it's not worth the risk. To me, it was a throwaway project. You know, give Liddy the quarter million dollars and let's get him off our back and, and satisfy the White House. And Mitchell finally said, OK, let's, let's go with it and uh, signed off on the paper. Actually put his initials, as he always did, on the approval box to go ahead with the project. I've reflected on this uh, many times. And at the Key Biscayne meeting, or even after that, had I gone to Mitchell and said, John, this is crazy. I mean, this is a harebrained scheme. It's not going to do a damn thing but get us in trouble. Uh, let's put a stop to it. If you have to, go to the White House and back them off the damn thing. 
had I done that and done it forcefully, uh, John would have listened to me. And he would have done that, and this whole mess could have been avoided. Uh, it's, it's one of the real regrets I have about Watergate. The president's campaign chairman had finally allowed Liddy's plan to go forward. But did the White House know? We have uncovered the only existing written evidence of the authorization of the Watergate project. For 20 years, it was thought that all copies of this memorandum had been deliberately destroyed by the aide who wrote it for Haldeman. This is a truly amazing document to service at this late date. And what the document says is that Gordon Liddy's intelligence operation proposal, 300,000, has been approved, right there in big black and white letters. If Haldeman knew about this, there is no doubt in my mind that Richard Nixon knew about this, because everything that Haldeman knew, he knew for the sake of Richard Nixon. And it's just inconceivable to me that, that this type of information, which Nixon loved, would not be shared with him. We knew that Gordon Liddy had been uh, set in as uh, this campaign counsel, but with the responsibility for intelligence. And uh, apparently he had, had a budget approved and was, was going to start moving on doing whatever he was going to do. I was called in by Jeb Stuart Magruder to his office, and he said, can you get into the Watergate office building? We want you to wiretap Larry O'Brien's telephone and uh, put in a room monitoring device so that conversations in there can be held. Anything that's available, we want it photographed. To photograph the documents, Liddy rehired the Cubans who would handle the Ellsberg job. If anything went wrong, their White House connection could not be traced. But the man he chose to bug the phones mainlined right back to the Nixon organization. I took the decision, a dangerous gamble and risk, something I had told people I wouldn't do, and I recruited Mr. James McCord, who was the security chief of the committee to re-elect the president. The president himself was 5,000 miles away in Moscow. He crowned a year of foreign policy triumphs by signing the first nuclear arms limitation agreement with the Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. On Sunday, May 28th, he concluded his trip with a televised speech to the Russian people. That very night, the security chief of his re-election committee with his Cuban colleagues broke into the Watergate. Once we got in, we found that uh, Larry O'Brien's door was locked um, to his office. It adjoined the, the reception area there. And uh, so there have been so much um, uh, time gone by and uh, there have been, frankly, so much noise made in, in gaining entry that we just didn't really want to uh, proceed to jimmy or break another lock. Instead, McCord placed a bug on the secretary's switchboard and a second phone nearby while the Cubans got to work on the documents. They set up a listening post in the Howard Johnson Motel opposite, but the bugs produced only trivia. I was distressed by them. They, they had nothing of value. I'm getting hairdressing appointments and things like that. I talked to Mitchell and I showed Mitchell what the, uh, what were the first fruits of uh, Liddy's endeavor, and he looked through it uh, rather quickly and agreed with me that these were worthless. What they wanted was specifically, well, what's Larry O'Brien up to and what's he doing and what's he saying? Uh, we were going to have to go back in again and put in more devices and make sure that we, we got what they were looking for. Mr. Magruder said, listen, Gordon, this is what I want. I want what Larry O'Brien has right here. And he struck his bottom desk drawer, which is where we kept what we had on the Democrats. Well, I was telling Liddy, look, I want the real stuff the, the, the information that's important, not the, the, the stuff that you've gotten for us. It has no meaning whatsoever to the campaign. And he was thinking, I want everything photographed. And I said to myself, my lord, 
what was supposed to be now a quick five minute in and out repair mission is a multi-hour photo recon mission. When they asked us to go for the second operation, they told me to get up, uh, I don't know, 50 uh, roll of film. So I multiplied 50 for 36, and I said, Jesus Christ, these people want a lot of pictures, you know. Entry night was uh, uh, to be uh, Friday night, to June 16th, uh, in anticipation of which the uh, Miami team uh, arrived in Washington that afternoon. The Cubans rendezvoused with their bosses, Hunt and Liddy, in the Watergate Hotel. Jim McCord and his assistant were across the street in the Howard Johnson, waiting until the coast was clear. There was a man working in the back very, very late. I mean, he stayed and he stayed and he stayed. It's a Friday night. I mean, this was some dedicated Democrat. We thought he'd never go home. Finally, about quarter to one, the word came from across the way at the lookout. Jim said uh, to whoever he was talking to on the phone, I think we can make a go. And with that, he said, Al, um, you're going to remain here. And he walked over to the bed and he took a micro, I mean, a walkie talkie. He said, I want you to use this. It was decided by Hunt and, 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 and Liddy that McCord, who had access to the building, would go into the Watergate building and go down there and open the thing from the inside and put in tapes in the door. McCord collected his men and tried to go back in. We came to the back door and tried the handle and the, the door was latched. Uh, someone obviously had taken and removed the tape, taken it off in that brief period of time. Had the police been alerted, McCord's bosses had to make a snap judgment. I said, let's scratch this, and uh, Liddy said, no, this is McCord's, uh, this is McCord's show, he's got to go through with it, and it's his fault that we're here, and besides, it's very important to my career that we do this. You know, I felt like refusing, saying, no, this is far enough. You go, but then I figured, you know, I was older, I was getting older, I wasn't a young kid anymore, and I... I, uh, my, my personal feeling was these people don't think I'm scared, you know. McCord put the telltale tape back on the doors, and this time the team made it into Democratic headquarters. We were in contact by transceiver with our men inside the Watergate and also with the lookout, Mr. Baldwin, across the street. Now the reception area to the Democratic headquarters lights up the actual uh, reception room which I can see directly across from where I'm standing and I know three individuals come into the reception area three plainclothes policemen discovered the break-in team crouched under desks and ordered them to come out with their hands up out comes a fellow a middle-aged man one of the Miami men dressed in a suit they were more nervous than we were when they found us there. I mean, we were dressed up and we were now the common burglar. Here comes a second man out from behind the second desk and he's dressed in a suit and he doesn't look like a burglar either. They come in waving guns and so forth. This is the police. What are you guys doing here? They were wired. They were hyper. They, they just, it didn't all add up. It didn't compute with them what was going on and who they had, except they knew we didn't belong there. The break-in was over, but for President Richard Nixon, Watergate had barely begun. The Watergate break-in had been planned, paid for, and executed by Nixon's campaign committee. But its high command was not in Washington on the day of the break-in. They were in California to campaign with a key figure. Back in Washington, the man in charge of the fiasco at the Watergate had to make a difficult phone call. And I wanted it to be uh, an absolutely secure conversation. I still had a White House pass. I went over into the White House and I went into what is known as the Situation Room. There was a KYX uh, scrambler phone over there uh, and it would be available. Well, 
Of course, there's no scrambler phone in the hotel where I'm told Mr. Magruder is. So I called Magruder and I said, look, I need to speak to you securely. There is a missile base, a guided missile base run by the Air Force, just in such and such a place. Go down there and hit Magruder. Why do I have to go to a missile base? Why do I have to talk? And I said, look, I need to speak to you securely. All I thought was there's Liddy playing his, you know, little spy, spy games again. Magruder used the most secure line available, the hotel payphone. Liddy told him that four of the men arrested, the same Cuban Americans they'd used before, couldn't be connected to Nixon. But the fifth man could. He was James McCord, who worked full-time for the president's campaign. Now Magruder had a difficult message for his superiors. He said, we got a slight PR problem. And uh, I said, well, if it's a PR problem, that's your bailiwick. He said, uh, this is a PR problem that requires a lawyer. Their thoughts turned to Richard Kleindienst, Mitchell's successor as attorney general. He had the power to order McCord's release from jail, but getting him to do it would be an obstruction of justice. You know, I just, I, at some point, somebody... I don't even know, I don't, I don't know if Mitchell said this, I don't know if Marty Anderson said it. Hell, I may have said it. Let's call client each and find out what's going on. But the Attorney General wasn't home. Their next call, as this phone bill from Mitchell's suite shows, went to Gordon Liddy's number at Nixon campaign headquarters. John Mitchell wanted me to get a hold of Richard Kleindienst, who was then the Attorney General of the United States, and to say that he, John Mitchell, wanted Richard Kleindienst to get McCord out of jail because McCord was the security chief of the committee to re-elect the president. Direct connection. Liddy tracked down Kleindienst at Burning Tree, an exclusive golf club outside Washington. They met in the locker room. Whereupon I said, okay, uh, I don't know whether you've heard about the break-in or anything. And I said, I have to tell you, that was our operation, my operation. I was responsible. He said, oh, God, you know. I said, yep, I made the mistake. He said, General, he said, John Mitchell told me to tell you to get these people out of jail right now, and I mean right now. And I said, what in the hell do you think you're talking about, Gordon? You know, Kleindienst was just apoplectic. I'm not going to do what you said, and if you say anything like that to me again, I'm going to put you in jail. And, and I said, yes, I said, I, I understand. I said, you know, you know, God knows what could what happen to you if you do a thing like that. He said, fuck what happens to me. What happens to the President of the United States that do a stupid thing like that? The newly sworn in Attorney General ordered that Watergate proceed like any other case. Yet he was sitting on the information that could have cracked it wide open on his first day. Kleindienst didn't tell the Watergate prosecutors about Gordon Liddy's confession, nor about John Mitchell's criminal demand to spring McCord. The chief law enforcement officer of the United States was closing his eyes to the cover-up. That same morning, FBI agents in his department were struggling to make sense of the unusual haul seized from the Watergate burglars. When we went into the uh, uh, property room, of spread out on the table were uh, electronic devices, walkie-talkies, uh, cameras, um, a huge amount of film, and a uh, gym bag. Um, curious that I was, I opened the gym bag and saw more film, um, and then there was some tissue paper. And I reached in to pull the tissue paper, and out fell a little black device with a couple of wires on it. This device was one of several electronic bugs the burglars had brought into Democratic headquarters. The men also carried keys to their rooms in the neighboring Watergate Hotel. In Bernard Barker's room, the FBI stumbled across an innocuous-looking clue. One of the agents, while assisting uh, the police, uh, was going through the dresser drawer, and uh, being as thorough as he was, you know, just flipping through there, the paper goes up, and. There's this envelope. I had given a letter of mine to Bernie Barker to mail. Asked him to, when he left the hotel room where Lydia and I were, uh, heading out uh, for the elevators, I had asked him to take this letter and drop it in the mail chute. 
Howard Hunt's carelessness would cost a lot more than the $6.36 that he owed his country club. The FBI ran his name through their files and found he was a longtime CIA officer whom they'd cleared for White House employment a year earlier. A few phone calls confirmed that he was indeed on the White House staff. For Nixon's men, keeping Watergate away from the president was going to be a nightmare. A few hours later, the campaign high command, their wives and the first lady, Pat Nixon, were at a Hollywood fundraising party. There they hobnobbed with movie stars Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, and Charlton Heston. On one side, it was a great party. I mean, it was wonderful. The women were having a great time, my wife had a great time. On the other hand, I'm still on the phone talking to some of my staff, trying to figure out really what's going on back in Washington after this disaster that occurred the night before. I went to the room for something and my wife said, Fred, what's wrong with you? He said, you, you look strange. You look like you're really upset about something. I said, I just can't talk about it right now, but something has occurred that could very well bring down this administration. If Nixon sensed a threat to his re-election, he showed no sign of it the next morning. All right. He was still relaxing in Florida. Uh, I came over, I saw the uh, Sunday morning papers and saw an item in the Miami Hair. Nixon has always maintained that his first reaction was anger. His line was that the Democrats kept no real secrets at party headquarters. It was the uh, most foolish, useless, uh, political caper of all time because what reason would anybody want to go if you're going to do any bugging you're going to bug the Democratic National Headquarters. Nixon needed someone at the White House to be full-time manager of the cover-up. The president's lawyer John Dean was perfectly placed to obstruct the criminal investigation. Dean is counsel to the president. He's liaison to the FBI and the police department and all of that. That is a natural part of his duties. When I arrived in the office, normal hours on, on Monday morning, Jeb Magruder called, told me what had happened, told me that Liddy had messed this whole thing up, and that he said, John, I can't talk to Gordon Liddy. You've got to talk to him and find out what happened and why. Dean met Liddy for his debriefing on a park bench across from an art gallery, just yards from the White House. I put him completely in the picture in a way so that he, being knowledgeable about these things, Dean could attempt to control the investigation and thereby the damage. I then finally said to him something that uh, disturbed Dean. I had in my head knowledge which could bring down a president of the United States. He said, John, I'm a soldier. He said, see that street corner over there? If you want me to stand on that street corner, you just tell me when and where I'll be there and you can shoot me. And John Dean said, well, gee, Gordon, I don't think we've gone that far yet. When Dean got back to his office, he discovered the crimes he would have to cover up didn't end at the campaign committee. They extended deep into the White House. Within the White House, uh, I was the president's line to the re-election committee, and Gordon Strawn was my line, and, and Strawn had the responsibility uh, assigned by me to stay abreast of all that was going on. Gordon Strawn asked for an urgent meeting with John Dean. He said, John, my files are clean. He said, I talked to Haldeman over the weekend, and I've gone through everything, and there's nothing there that's going to embarrass us. Alderman had ordered the shredding of all the political espionage memos sent to him by the campaign committee. These were evidence of complicity in Watergate at the highest level. This was the most troublesome report I had had in my initial review of what was going on. 
because I said if Strawn knows, Haldeman knows. If Haldeman knows, the president knows. So I looked around and I said, this place is in a world of hurt. On day three of Watergate, the White House was already up to its neck in obstruction of justice. There would be no going back, and the president's campaign committee still held the original evidence of the crime, the transcript of conversations bugged at the Watergate, codenamed Gemstone. I said to Mitchell, what should I do with the Gemstone files? And he said, I think you ought to have a fire in your fireplace tonight. Well, of course, it was in the, late in June, a rather uh, unusual time to have a fire, but uh, that's uh, what he wanted to do, and that's actually what I did. Oh, heavens! Yes, the frogs are telephone. Oh, ladies and gentlemen! Not all John Mitchell's problems were so easy to deal with. His flamboyant wife, Martha, a darling of the campaign, had a habit of making indiscreet phone calls. All right, Isabel, here's the scoop. I've never talked to her yet, but what I haven't gotten a good news story, so I automatically, she was in California, and, and uh, the Democratic headquarters uh, alleged bugging incident had broken out, and that was my immediate question. Well, what do you think about that? And she said, I've given John an ultimatum. This really set her off. While she talked to the UPI reporter, Martha Mitchell's security guard called Fred LaRue on another line. He said, Fred, Miss Mitchell's on the phone with Helen Thomas. Uh, she's telling her a bunch of stuff about Watergate. And I said, oh, well, she really doesn't know anything about Watergate. And he said, well, she's telling her a bunch of stuff anyway. What should I do? I said, well, just go pull the phone out of the wall. And uh, pretty soon, I mean, we, we didn't, weren't into a conversation, but I heard her uh, saying, get away, get away. And I didn't know what was happening, and then there was a phone disconnect. To keep her from talking about Watergate, Martha Mitchell was forcibly sedated and held incommunicado. Her husband found it easy to paint the affair as the antics of a hysterical female. Finally got him on the phone, and, and he, he was not too perturbed. He said, I love that little girl. He said, so it seemed that everything was going to be all right. Late that Monday night, the president returned to Washington and took the reins into his own hands. In the first few days after Watergate, uh, the, the president was proactive in this thing. I think partly because he's a compulsive conspiracy theorist um, and, and just couldn't leave the stuff alone. The president's conversations with his aides, which were automatically captured by his secret taping system, show that he devoted hour after hour to Watergate. For 20 years until his death, Nixon managed to prevent access to most of these tapes. Now, a tape not previously played in public reveals that Nixon was directing the conspiracy even earlier than had been known. He acted through his closest associates, John Mitchell, John Ehrlichman, and Chief of Staff Haldeman. president had an idea. Howard Hunt, before Watergate and his job at the White House, had been in the CIA. He was one of the officers in charge of the agency's 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. Perhaps the White House could use Hunt's past to confuse the FBI. Very hard. 
because he's, he was working on a lot of stuff. The problem is that there are all kinds of other involvements, and if they start a fishing thing on this, they're going to start picking up threads, and that's, that's what appeals to me about trying to get one jump ahead of them. Someone else who could lead the FBI to those other involvements was Gordon Liddy. He laid out for Nixon's campaign managers just what could come out. Liddy's warning was delivered back in the Watergate complex. It was not only the scene of the crime, but also home to many members of the Nixon set, including Mitchell's close confidant, Fred LaRue. Gordon commenced to tell us there were other things that had been done that we should be aware of. And I said, well, what, you know, what other things? He said, well, he said, we've had an operation going, or Hunt's had this operation going. Uh, we've done certain things for the White House. Liddy told the tale of the White House plumbers unit and the crimes he and the Watergate team had carried out for the president. The most serious was a break-in mounted by Howard Hunt to neutralize Daniel Ellsberg, a leading opponent of Nixon's Vietnam policy. They tried to steal his psychiatric files and use them to smear him. If that came out, it could badly hurt the Nixon campaign. Well, when he started disclosing all of these nefarious activities that uh, he was involved in uh, at the behest of the White House, uh, and what he inferred was with the full authority of the President of the United States just appalled me. Liddy then told them how they tried to break into Democratic candidate George McGovern's office. Liddy had his own way of dimming the lights outside. I just shot out the first three lamps. The second three I found, uh, I, I couldn't get a clear shot at because of a uh, steel girder overstructure. So I called over uh, the ever helpful Frank Sturgis, who's a big bull of a man, and uh, he bent over, and I climbed up on his shoulders and was able to get up onto the steel scaffolding, and from there, I shot out the remaining three lines. I said, uh, Gordon, you told me that none of the Cubans could identify you. Certainly the man whose shoulders you sat on to shoot the light out could identify you. He said, no, he couldn't. He never saw my face. These problems could be contained only if the break-in team kept their mouths shut. Liddy explained what had to be done. The usual thing in a situation like this in the intelligence service is that they will have bail provided for them, they will have counsel, legal counsel provided for them, there will be support for their families. Marion and LaRue reported to John Mitchell, Nixon's closest political friend. He had to decide whether to honor the commitment to pay hush money. I said, John, you know, it's not just the Watergate. We have other potential problem here that could easily come up. Uh, and I guess we looked at each other and uh, at that point, we both knew those commitments had to be kept. That same evening, Mitchell got a call from the president, the first since the Watergate break-in. He was terribly chagrined that people in his organization uh, could have engaged in such a thing and that uh, as I recall it he said I I I don't I just wasn't uh, policing the people in my organization as well as I should have five days after the Watergate break-in the burglars were arraigned in court and released on bail the president's men set about organizing their hush money Richard Nixon's private lawyer Herb Kalmbach got the assignment Kalmbach collected $75,000 of Nixon campaign funds, but he needed to find somebody to deliver it. I got a call to, to come down to Washington and to meet with Mr. Herbert Kalmbach. I came to the hotel in Washington, D.C. I came up in, uh, right away. He was, uh, didn't have his socks on, and he apologized for that. And I'd been in the Army and the Navy, and he apologized for not having his socks on. At any rate, he got in, in, into this story that uh, he had met with John Dean, a park bench across from the White House. Dean said that on the highest authority, it was decided that
that Herb Kambach would provide funds and that Tony Alasowitz, the only one that they could trust, would distribute said funds to those who broke into the Watergate uh, building. So now he's, uh, he has an attache case and he's got 75 grand in it. The 75,000 now, he's taking it out of the attache case and putting it on a bed. Now 75 grand, you know, is quite a bit of letters. And there was a laundry bag in the closet, one of these that very thin brown paper that you put your laundry and leave it out the door. And I plucked all that cabbage, I put it into the bag, tied it up with the string, maybe twice over, put it under my arm, and said, we'll be in touch. Now I'll await your instructions. On June 23rd, day seven, the nation awoke to discover flooding in many of the eastern states. But Nixon's mind was on Watergate. On that day, he issued an order, which when it became public two years later, ended his presidency. What led to the order was a meeting between the cover-up's manager, John Dean, and acting FBI director, Pat Gray, who had alarming news about the investigation. On that morning, Dean called me with a report, as he did from time to time when there was some development on Watergate, uh, <clears throat> in which he said, and I'm reading from my notes here, my notes say, investigation out of control, Gray doesn't know what to do. Then I say, They've found money out of Mexican bank. We'll know who the depositors were today. FBI agents had traced the cash seized from the Watergate burglars to a bank in Mexico. If the FBI was not stopped immediately, it would discover that this money laundered in Mexico came from the Nixon campaign. Fortunately for the White House, Pat Gray drew the wrong conclusions at this point. On the evening of June 22nd, I met with Pat Gray over at his office in the FBI. And he now was convinced, after looking at everything, that the most likely explanation for what had gone on was that this was a CIA operation that they'd stumbled into. Nixon's men knew the CIA wasn't behind Watergate. The FBI's confusion, however, gave them a plausible pretext to shut down the investigation. Nixon would say it was jeopardizing national security. After talking to Dean, Haldeman briefed the president in the Oval Office. The tape of this meeting would be the smoking gun that ended the Nixon presidency. I said, now on the investigation, you know the Democratic break-in thing. I mean, it wasn't Watergate then. It was the Democratic break-in thing. Now, on the investigation, of the Democratic break-in thing, it's not going to the problem there is that the FBI is not under control. Haldeman presented the president with the plan. Again, I'm saying what Dean, what Mitchell recommended and Dean concurred with, according to what Dean told me, is for us to have Walters, Walters is the deputy director of the CIA at that time, General Vernon Walters, call Pat Gray. Pat Gray was the director of the FBI at that time, acting director and just say, stay the hell out of this. This is a business here we don't want you to go any further on. And that was just rather well because the FBI agents who are working the case, at this point, feel that's what it is. They feel that they have been CIA. But would the CIA cooperate? Nixon told Haldeman to threaten CIA Director Richard Helms that if his agency didn't stomp the FBI, then the CIA's 1961 Bay of Pigs fiasco would be dredged up again. He said, when you get in, when you get in the people, say, look, this is the president now saying to me, look, the problem is that this will open the whole, the whole Bay of Pigs thing. My purpose, my primary purpose, as is clearly indicated by the tape, and I don't dispute it at all, uh, I wanted to stop the investigation, if possible. We got word that uh, Haldeman and Ehrlichman 
wanted to meet with Helms and Walters at one o'clock at the White House. And we went in to see uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, who talked in a general way about the embarrassment of this and so forth and so on, and people had shown excessive zeal, and then Mr. Haldeman came in. The president has asked us to tell you that he wants, I think I said Dick Walters, to contact Pat Gray at the FBI and explain to them that exploring these Cubans and their ties and, and all that sort of thing and the money source may lead into all sorts of other things that we don't shouldn't be getting into and that they should not go any further in that exploration. At that point, Haldeman carried out the president's ploy. He warned Helms that Watergate could reopen the Bay of Pigs controversy. Helms, a typically cold as a cucumber, icy, super spy type guy, came totally unglued. Frankly, to this day, when I think back on that meeting, it's a long time ago, but it didn't seem to me that any of these things made any sense much. He leaped up in enormous excitement, concern, and panic and said, this has nothing to do with the Bay of Pigs, and there's no problem about the Bay of Pigs, and the CIA had nothing to do with this, and on and on and on and on. And he finally calmed down, and they agreed that Walters would go talk to the FBI. Helms prudently complied. He told General Walters to go to the FBI and ask Gray to cut off the investigation in Mexico immediately. The case agent, the agent in charge, Angie Lano, came to me and told me that uh, there'd been a halt. I'd asked him, you know, what was happening, what was, what was going on with the investigation in Mexico, and Angie told me there'd been a, a halt put on it by the CIA. I'm getting telephone calls from the assistant United States attorney, Earl Silbert, saying, Angelo, what's going on? And I'm saying, Earl, what can I tell you? Every time we want to do something, somebody says, hold, wait, stop, no interview, wait, hold, stop. Inside the White House, Howard Hunt had a safe crammed with files on Watergate and earlier covert operations. John Dean had it drilled open. I realize that some of this material is extremely explosive politically. Uh, some of it is probably direct evidence of crime. Uh, I went over to Ehrlichman's office to explain to him what we'd found in the safe. And he told me that he had proposed to deliver these contents personally to Pat Gray, who was the acting director of the FBI, and leave it to Gray's discretion then, so that if there were an investigation of what became of Howard Hunt's possessions, we could very truthfully say that we had turned them over to the investigators. I distinctly recall Mr. Dean saying that these files were political dynamite and clearly should not see the light of day. It is true that neither Mr. Ehrlichman nor Mr. Dean expressly instructed me to destroy the files. But there was and is no doubt in my mind that destruction was intended. Gray, a Nixon loyalist, took the files home and put them under a pile of shirts. Six months later, he would burn them with his Christmas wrapping paper. While their boss was concealing evidence, FBI agents were uncovering more. Combing through one of the burglar's address books, the agents were baffled by this entry. They discover that Howard Hunt's telephone in the White House, WH number 202-456-2282, wasn't being billed in the normal way. The bill was being sent to a girl over in Alexandria, Virginia. So we said, well, that's strange. So we went to Alexandria and found out that she was a, an employee at the, at the White House named Kathleen Chanel. Kathleen Chenow, secretary to Hunt and Liddy when they worked in the White House Plumbers Unit, had typed all their memos, including break-in plans. Her knowledge could bring the investigators right to the Oval Office. She happened to be on holiday in England. The FBI sent a teletype to his man in London, asking him to track down and question Chenow. But the White House had been tipped off. Immediately we realized that, you know, if she was broadsided by agents, uh, no telling what she'd say. So we decided we had to find her first. And I don't think the request was over, was over here 
five or six hours when the telephone rang again and said, hold. And I said, on what? And they said, no interview of Chanel until uh, um, the White House. The White House is going to bring her back. The next morning after they arrived, we impressed upon her the importance to not spill the beans, if you will. We told her, first of all, these things were not relevant to the Watergate investigation. He told me to answer all the questions uh, truthfully and to the best of my ability, but to remember that I was under the cloak of national security, that I had had many top secret and intelligence clearances. They came under this broad category of national security, which uh, was a wonderful uh, uh, tool for us to uh, sweep a lot of things that we didn't want out to, uh, under the rug. The FBI questioned Chanel, but got nothing out of her. Two vital weeks had been lost since the FBI's Gray had stalled the investigation at the CIA's request. But his staff was straining at the leash. He called me and said he couldn't suspend this anymore. So I went to see him and I said, I have carefully investigated this matter. There are no operations of the CIA that will in any way be jeopardized by this. and You're perfectly free to do it. Nixon, on vacation in California, learned that Walters and Gray couldn't impede the investigation any longer. He put the best possible face on it. I called uh, uh, Pat Gray to congratulate the FBI on a very successful the operation they had in apprehending some hijackers. He then brought up the subject uh, of the Watergate investigation. He said that there are some people around you who are mortally wounding you, or would might mortally wound you, because they're trying to restrict this investigation. I said, Pat, you go right ahead with your investigation. Well, it's easy to miss the irony, perhaps, in this, which was, that this whole thing was Richard Nixon's idea to involve the CIA in deflecting the FBI. The president promptly came up with a more brazen scheme to scuttle the Watergate case. To pull it off, he needed some hostages. What he would do is uh, cause a bunch of uh, Democrats to be uh, arrested, and then he would grant clemency to both Democrats and Republicans. Ehrlichman's note shows that they planned to tell the Secret Service to book and charge anti-Nixon demonstrators. And then the day after the election, the president would issue a general pardon, which would also quash the Watergate investigation. But there were still four months to election day. Nixon's re-election machine looked unstoppable. But he knew if the Watergate burglars started talking, there could be trouble. So his campaign funds were used to buy not just support, but silence. As the cover-up continued, Howard Hunt and his wife began taking delivery of the hush money to distribute to the burglars. at the airport and I would uh, because lockers were always handy I get a locker number I take the key put the money in the locker take the key out and I would tape it underneath the telephone then I would call on another phone I would call the person whatever name we used Mrs. Hunt in that time one time Mr. Hunt appeared and picked it up and I would say the key is taped on there you take that key and go and uh, go to the locker and pick up your drop and that's the way we did it and we, it worked very well. Nixon's men paid out more than a quarter of a million dollars in hush money that summer. It did the trick. The burglars kept silent. So too did Howard Hunt and his partner in crime. Gordon Liddy had now become a prime suspect. We called over to FBI headquarters and we said we identified another person. Uh, can you run this name? And within minutes they come back and say, G. Gordon Liddy, former FBI agent. 
Well, you know, by now I'm going, you know, what is this? CIA people, FBI people, you know, what is it? You know, really, what is going on here? Who's hiring all these people and why? The way the conspiracy appeared to us to be shaping up with Liddy at the top based on the evidence we had, if it went higher and we didn't know whether it went higher, the logical person based both on position and responsibilities would have been Jeb Magruder. Magruder is deputy campaign chief had to explain away nearly $100,000 that Liddy used for Watergate. Magruder concocted a story that the money was budgeted for campaign security, but that Liddy, all on his own, decided to spend it on a break-in. Now, what I had to do was, number one, I had to go to the prosecutors and tell that story and make that believable, but number two, I had to have somebody to back it up. Well, I refer to this as the sting. Um, I w was in my office, and Jeb came to the door and asked if I could join him in his office. Well, I pitched it to Bart basically on the basis that I needed his help, that uh, uh, we were in a quandary, that this guy Liddy had gone off on his own, had uh, done these things that had uh, really created problems, but we had to have some way to justify giving him the money. Magruder asked Porter to corroborate the story of a meeting at which Liddy's $100,000 budget was supposedly approved. Basically, the bottom line was, if anybody asks you, it's kind of if anybody asks you, whether it was an attorney or whoever, anybody asks you, it would be helpful if you could remember a number like around $100,000 that we discussed at that time. And uh, so without much ado, I, I, uh, my big error, of course, was to that I said, yeah, I would do that. They would have to testify under oath before the Watergate grand jury. If the prosecutors and the jurors didn't swallow their story, Magruder would be charged. Inevitably, he would drag Nixon's top aides down with him. We were all aware that I was going to go up and perjure myself, and that was the way the cover-up was going to work. You go up and you testify to the, uh, why we spent the money with Liddy, and then you bring Porter in and he tells, backs up your story. Uh, we were not uh, five-year-olds. It's a lawyer's distinction, but I must say, and it's self-serving, that I did advise him. I said, Jeb, I can't tell you to go in front of that grand jury to perjure yourself, but I will tell you, I'll give you a good question, and I know exactly the kind of questions they're going to ask you. And so I spent about a couple hours just grilling him and getting him ready for his perjury. Magruder took his oath and told his lies. Then it was Porter's turn. I had to repeat uh, this particular story about the about the hundred thousand dollar amount, uh, and all the rest of it was uh, all the rest of what I said there was quite factual. Uh, my mention of the hundred thousand uh, dollars, as as we know, was not. For the moment, Magruder got away with it. Federal indictments were returned in Washington today in the Watergate Democrats bugging affair. Complaints. Sources here at the Justice Department say the investigation by both the FBI and the grand jury is over. There is no evidence, they insist, that Outside anyone else was involved. The last witness was called this morning, virtually guaranteeing there will be no trial before Election Day. On September 15th, the four Cubans, and McCord, Hunt, and Liddy, were charged. No one else. We had contained the matter during the campaign uh, because I didn't feel at that time uh, that any erosion of the, of the strength of the president in the country, of his support in the country, and also I didn't feel that his defeat in an election uh, would be in the best interest of the country. On September 15th, came back to my office, Jane, my secretary, said, the president wants to see you over in the Oval Office. I was really quite surprised. The basic reason for the meeting was to give John Dean a feeling that the president was pleased with his work and was thanking him for it, patting him on the shoulder and saying, good boy, well done. In essence, uh, uh, the president said, you know, just want to tell you what a good job you've done with the cover-up. What surprised me is I really, for the first time, began to see who Richard Nixon was in this meeting. He sort of let down and began to tell me about how we've got to uh, get after our enemies that have done us wrong during this whole Watergate matter after the election. Uh, 
mother is going this quite a clever thing and they're asking for it and they're going to get it. We haven't used the arrow, we haven't used the Justice Department, but things are going to change now. And they're going to change and they're going to get it right. On November 7, 1972, Richard Nixon carried 49 of 50 states, re-elected president by the biggest margin in history, and it looked as though he had gotten away with his crimes.